Welcome, ladies and gents, to another episode of the Popcorn Square. Today, we are feeling nostalgic. I am your host, Kage. Along with Neff. And Buttons. And we are talking about movies back in the day. We're talking about nostalgia. What makes these movies nostalgic? What's nostalgic to you? Uh, This is going to be a fun one for us. Um, So, I mean, this is something I feel like we can go on and on and on about, honestly. We got so many great movies of the 90s, from our childhood 90s, early 2000s. Oh, my God. Uh, A little bit off mic, we were talking about um, Independence Day. That was a big one, Men in Black uh, back in the day, that, mm-hmm. those were big. Yeah. Um, guilty pleasure, yes, folks, I'm going to admit this. I'm, I'm getting a smile over here from Buttons. I liked Wild Wild West. It was a fun movie. I know mm. it got hated <laughs> in the movie theater, but like, I was like, you know what? This is just a fun time. It's just a fun time. Uh, but yeah, those are just some movies uh, just right now off the top of my head uh, that I want to talk about. But um, Neff, can you tell me some some movies that wow, come to mind when you talk about nostalgia. Well, you know, Nightmare Before Christmas, of course, oh, probably absolutely. my favorite movie ever. Um, um, man, let me think. Even like dark stuff like Seven, just the, the yeah. vibe of the film gave me like that 1990s, mid to late 1990s New York vibe. Um, Matrix, not so much. That's more of sci-fi, but there is some cityscapes in there. Uh, I think... More nostalgia I get from shows rather than mm. movies so much. And so I was watching The X-Files the other night. Mm. Just, we've talked about The X-Files before course, and how I like that show. So that's something I get a lot of nostalgic vibes from. Um, uh, Star Trek Next Generation. Uh, a show I used to watch used to be on the sci-fi channel called Beyond Belief. Hosted oh, by Jonathan wow. Frakes. That's something I've heard of in a Yeah, minute. that's one of my favorite shows ever. That gave me a lot of that 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 feel. Uh, goosebumps, of course, things yes. like that. Are you afraid of the dark? Yes. Um, yeah. Just things like that. Right, things like childhood. that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Almost um, not so much time period piece things, but... Yeah, like stuff like that. But I feel like I feel I get more nostalgia from shows more than movies okay. that I can really pinpoint. But I'm glad you brought up like Men in Black, Independence Day, movies like that because they are set in that time. Uh, Bad Boys is one that I get oh, nostalgia yes. from. Excellent. That 1995 Excellent. Miami, Florida vibe. You know what I mean? Um, those are just a couple to name a few. What you got, Buttons? Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say that, yeah, I watched a lot of different things in the 90s, but... I get nostalgia vibes, not just from those 90 films, but all those films that we watched on TV as reruns. Um, So, you know, that older catalog, 80s, 70s even. Um, Just movies movies that just kind of stick with you because they're either really super camp or they're just, they were on every time. Like, you know, the same movies came on over and over. And I mean, you know... Again, you're going to have some guilty pleasures. You're going to have some of those movies where you're like, man, these movies were awful. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite movies that I, I probably would still watch again if you put it on for me is like Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. It's an <laughs> awful movie, guys. Like really, there's, it's, it's really just cheesy. But I enjoy it. And I still, you know, I'm like, I'm right on top of that, Rose. You know, because there's... There's just something about it that speaks to me and and just puts me back in that same feeling of being a kid and watching uh, that movie and, and that time of my life. Right. Um, that, again, it's it's pure nostalgia. It's, yeah, that was what was on. That's what I would watch. I mean, you have all those Ernest films, you know, Ernest Scared Stupid oh, yeah, and right. Ernest Goes to Camp and, you know, and, and some of these movies, again, for me, one of my favorite movies, and I'll still watch it again, like every Halloween is going to be like those Adams Family movies, like, and Casper. Right. Remember oh. Casper? Like, yes. You guys Christy's... remember Dennis the Menace? Oh, yeah, Dennis Whoa, the Menace, we're talking yeah. talking about Little Rascals. Huge, yeah. Our generation Ooh, like Little Rascals. Yeah, yes. I remember that. Darla and Alfalfa. Okay, no, anyway. Um, I gotta we're unlocking I memories yeah. right now, man. So, um, <laughs> Home Alone. You know, yeah, Home Classic. Alone. And, and again, you know, a lot of these movies... We sit there and we're like, okay, yeah, they're, they might, they might for me anyway, 90% be kids movies, but there are going to be those other movies that, um, you know, you go back and you look at and, and you're like, oh man, those, those gave you like the chills or the feels or whatever, you know, either whether it was like 
oh, this is exciting. This is the cutting edge movie of, of the time. I mean, movies like Alien, you know, and Aliens came out. And so those ones, uh, Jurassic Park, um, you know, that's you got a the big original, one to me. Yeah. Another, that was like ground ba- breaking when it came out, you know, as far as the animatronics and the effects that they had for that. I mean, the T Rex running is like yeah. one of the very first true CGI. Um, you know, graphics that they used right. in movies as far as, you know, you're like, you didn't know. You were like watching it. And mm-hmm. You're like, damn, that looks good. Um, and so with that kind of nostalgia for me, like I think of those movies that, you know, either scared the pants off me as a kid uh, or they were movies that I watched over and over and over regardless of when they came out. And, you know, or they were maybe films that, you know, my my father or my mother loved, and so they would play. Um, or they were just movies that, you know, I'd watch with friends. Funny, I'm going to add in something there. There's this interesting episode. I believe it's season three, Black Mirror, called San Junipero. And that episode, um, the, the main character, um, she basically goes to different time periods trying to find her girlfriend. And that was like a real interesting show. Like she literally goes, and it's kind of like that nostalgia rush for different Mm. eras. It's like, oh, she's in the 90s now looking for her. Oh, she's, you know what I mean? And it's just, that was a real interesting episode there, but that kind of did that as well. And once again, like I said, it's like the shows that I really get that, that, that nostalgia, that nostalgia rush from. Um, Let's go to that next topic that we got there, Kage, about the time period piece films. Yeah, so this topic is kind of, is a really interesting one because it's based upon the idea of is a movie good because of the time that it's in? And would that movie hold up today? Now, certainly it would hold up to us because maybe we associate that movie with our childhood. I think we all have our own reasons on what makes a movie nostalgic, you know. But, um, yeah, it... Like what? Can you think of movies that you watched back in the day that wouldn't hold up today? Like they were they were good because of the time they were in, you know. Mm. Well, I do know if we're going to talk about certain movies that they've done remakes of over the years, um, you know, they're the same story but they're told in a different way to well, make right. it more relevant to the time period. Correct. Right. So I mean, you can look at movies like. Uh, Well, I'll just go ahead and say Shakespeare is one of the ones that we see that over the years. They take it and they adapt it Mm -hmm. into a movie that's a time period, you know, but it's Shakespeare. The story is Shakespeare. Correct. Um, uh, I can't think of an immediate example within this decade, but... To me, (laughs) to me for... She's the man is Twelfth Night. Right. Like, that one for sure... Is directly at Shakespeare, um, and it's the story of Twelfth right. Night, but it's a reimagined version of that of, of that right. play. What I'm thinking of, and it's kind of two different things, but Kage, I, I see where he's going with it. Mm-hmm. What I'm thinking of is a movie that's it's a new movie set in a different time. So, a yeah. bit, so what I'm talking like a, a movie that I like a lot, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and it follows like the events of. Um, uh, Charlie Manson and Sharon Tate and all the things that happened uh, leading up to her death. But in the movie, she doesn't end up dying. But like I said, it's like a time period piece. And mm-hmm. I think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood came out, man, I want to say, dang, it, I don't I don't think it's been five years. But it's come out, I'll say, within the least, at least last the last five years. Mm-hmm. So that's like a time period piece that I really like. And uh, another time period piece would be Lincoln. That had, that had Daniel Day Lewis in that, like right. that type of stuff right there. But yeah, Kage, he brought up a good point with that. You know, um, do these films still hold up that were from a different time yeah, period? I'm- right. So I, I think they do, but I also think with as far as the nostalgia stuff goes, I'm going to hit two birds with one stone here. I think a lot of it is generational. So someone that was really growing up in the 70s, maybe feel the same about the 70s movies that how we would feel about the 90s movies because we grew up in the 90s. You see what I mean? They might not feel the same about 90s movies that we do because they didn't grow up in the 90s. So I think it might be something like that. But I do think a lot of the films that we do gravitate towards, I'd say the majority of them are good quality films. Because even if you were to look at some of the ratings for certain things like Lion King, 
you're getting like 95s out of 100s and stuff like that. And you can argue it's probably the best animated kids film ever. And it's still The Lion King. It still holds up. Jurassic yeah. Park still holds up. You don't watch Jurassic Park and say, I don't know what I was thinking. Like, you know what I mean? It still holds up even with the, the advances in technology that we have now. Like we talked about in another sep- episode before, sometimes you want to see more practical because it yeah. was just higher quality back mm-hmm. then, and they've kind of substituted that for microwaving it with CGI. So I think to answer your question, these movies still do hold up. Yeah, there I are a few uh, where you're just kind of like, really? But at that time, it was really as well. You know what I mean? They probably weren't well-received. The ones know, that are seen as well-received, they still hold up. What you got? I, well, I, would, I just want to bounce off what Button said. Uh, Jurassic Park is very near and dear to my heart. Back mm-hmm. when I was a kid, I wanted to be a paleontologist. Fun fact, everybody. Um, so I knew a lot about dinosaurs. I used to go to the library and read books about dinosaurs and all that stuff. And so when that movie came out, I was just in awe. Like I knew it wasn't real, but man, did it look real. You know what I mean? And then you watch behind the scenes stuff and they made an animatronic giant T Rex. Right. Multiple they were, animatronic right, uh, right, dinosaurs. They, right. The, Even like, Congo was using those practical effects mm-hmm. with the yeah, gorillas. That, like and I think that's what makes nineties movies so great was they were really running from yelling at a giant object. I mean, yeah, it might not have been real, might have been animatronic, but they were physically interacting with something. Whereas now, Avengers Endgame, you got a bunch of fully souped up actors in a sta- stage in a hangar somewhere, and there's a green screen, and they're pretending to yell at a monster that isn't there, and everyone looks and feels silly, but that's the part of being an actor. You have to act like you see that. You have to act like you're scared. You're engaging with whatever that thing is. But back in the day, that T-Rex in Jurassic Park, they were really looking at this thing coming up into the car and trying to eat the car, and the kids were trying to keep them off it. You know what I mean? Like, they were really looking at that. Right. Um, I, we don't have that anymore. Can you guys think of any time period piece films that you guys like? Okay, so I will say this only only because, uh, you know, Kage brought up the mm-hmm. special effects. So another one that's probably near and dear to my heart would have been the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Oh, uh, And Honey, I Blew Up the Kids. So those ones, you know, you can sit there and say, okay, the special effects in that don't really hold up as well when you compare it to, like, today's special effects. But like you said... Kage, there's a lot of practical effects that went into those movies as mm-hmm. well. Um, giant, you know, set pieces and things that the, that the actors could interact with. And sure, some of it looks really cheesy. Some of it looks where you're sitting there and you're going like, yeah, it looks like a bad monster film from like back in the 50s. Like if you go back and look at one of those films, you can say, yeah, it doesn't hold up visually. Um, but honestly, the story was good. The, the acting was good. I mean, even for a, a largely, you know, um, child actor dominated uh, cast, it, it holds up, um, you know, as far as the content goes. Uh, but when you're looking at a period piece, Again, you're still going to have, just like we did, uh, one, of the, one of the movies that uh, you guys might not have seen, but they, again, I go back to Shakespeare because I like Shakespeare, and they, in the 90s, they had their own set of Shakespeare movies that they came out with, Shakespeare in Love, uh, Midnight Summer's Dream, um, and that one had Keanu Reeves and Denzel in it, uh, and Michael Keaton, and that one, uh, you know, I love. Michelle Pfeiffer, I think, was in that one, too. So, I mean, there was a a big number of, you know, famous actors and actresses in that movie, um, and it was Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, in the 90s, you also had Leonardo DiCaprio and, uh, oh, gosh, I can't remember her name, Kate something. Kate Winslet. Winslet. No, wait, no. Titanic, No, that's Titanic. No, I was thinking of Leonardo did, was it Beckinsale? I can't. Kate, Kate, well, Kate Beckinsale and Kate Winslet are the two Kates I know. I don't think okay. Kate Beckinsale was really maybe, active maybe like that. Yeah. Maybe it's somebody else. But mm-hmm. anyway, um, he did Shakespeare is what I'm getting at. He did Romeo and Juliet mm-hmm. um, in the 90s with, uh, I can't remember her name. But anyway, when you're looking at those kind of films and you say, okay, 
uh, do those hold up? Are they, and it's a period piece. Because they don't have the technology, because they don't have a lot of those features in them, they make them timeless. You know, um, and so a lot of the films that, even like The Lion King that uh, Neff brought up, because it's animated, it is timeless. There's nothing in there that's going to date it and make it yeah, seem that's a great like point. It, it could be pulled out of an era and then come into this, you know, uh, viewership, this current viewership. They can all sit down and enjoy The Lion King. There's nothing in it that's going to that's gonna date that film so much that kids are going to be like, oh, this is completely, you know, unrealistic, unbelievable, I can't watch this. You know, movies like Clueless and other ones that had the technology in there, you sit there and go, huh, why are they using that big brick? Like, what is that? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, you you watch these movies and, and you sit there and you go, oh, yeah, man, that dates it. You watch, like, Hackers yeah. and you're like, why do they have these huge – is that a computer? That can't be a computer. Like, what's up with that? Like, why is it so huge? The first Tron. Yeah, <laughs> the first Tron Ooh. compared to – yeah, compared to the Tron, Tron Legacy. Legacy yeah. yeah, exactly. So, I mean – um, you know, when you're talking about movies that don't hold up over time, that could be another way to discuss that conversation is, yeah, can you take that exact movie and throw it into um, current time? Right. And would it still hold and, up? And would it right. still hold up? Would that story still be valid? Would it make sense? Yeah. You know, when you make a remake of something, and I, and I know we've discussed this before, which is you've got mail is a remake of Shop Around the Corner, or Little Shop Around the Corner, and that was originally a black and white film. Correct. Um, and so when you look at that, they had to update it. They had to bring new things into it. And guess what? You've Got Mail does not translate to this current generation uh. that we're in. There's no, nobody knows what AOL is anymore. Uh, like right, you, ask, yeah. you ask Generation Z what AOL is, <laughs> they're going to be like, uh, I have no idea. Like, you know, if somebody tells them America Online, they're going to be like, so it's like an internet thing? Like, yeah. they're, they're not going to have any idea. Somebody's going to have to explain to them what AOL is. Or and literally then, change the whole concept now to, like you said, a reimagine. Now it. it's going to be text yeah. you, messaging you've got instead DMs. of emailing. Yeah, you, exactly. <laughs> oh, they slid into my DMs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I got Claire Danes played Julia. Claire Danes. Okay, ah. yeah. Claire Danes. So, yeah. yeah. So Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes did Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. And again, with Shakespeare, you have all of these different um, great stories that people loved and they still love, even, you know, back from what was he active in, like the 14th century or some, yeah. something, yeah. 16th? I don't remember. One something. of those. I'm sorry, Shakespeare, I have failed you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I know your body of work, and yet I don't know, I don't remember from back in the day when I was studying you in English class what years you were active. Shakespeare will be all right in his grave. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, what I, you got, Kage? Well, I was just going to say, I think Disney is a perfect example of turning out movies that are just timeless that's kind mm -hmm. of their mo i think right. you you can watch lion king you can watch aladdin uh so many great uh oh, stories fantasies. yeah yeah for, yeah, sure. yeah for sure like i'll watch that to this day mm -hmm. uh you know some some movies i i don't think i could watch uh, the fox and the hound that hurts oh, bambi that, does hurt. that hurts <laughs> yeah so some movies it, it's not that they don't hold up it's just like I've grown up and I'm I'm not naive anymore and like certain things would hurt my soul. I can't. No, I don't but, want to but, see Mufasa but, die again. But there again, with the same thing, and you know, Disney keeps keeps a very similar formula. And you know, the joke has always been like it's not a Disney movie if if both the parents are still alive at the end. Right. You know? Wow. <laughs> and, 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 but you it's know. it's common. I mean, I can I can only think of like maybe a handful where it doesn't have some kind of family death. In the movie. Right, there's got to be some type of impactful event that kind of gets the the uh, I guess the the eventual main that character on their yeah. right on their event. on their journey voyage. Yeah. Um, let's talk about I guess the differences in when let's say a director or a studio tries to take on a futuristic like film or even modern time film and a peer, a time period piece. Do you feel like um, it's harder to work on something that may be futuristic or modern or it's harder to do time period peace films because of just the fact that the, the I guess the time period you have to be factually correct about a lot of things yeah. you could do whatever you want to do but if it's not factually 
um, in alignment with what happened, then people can go back and fact check and say, this is what is this? They made their own, you know, their own thing up. They, they're rewriting history. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Whereas if you have something that's modern times and new, you can kind of just do what you want and no one can go back and say, that's not the car so and so drove. They yeah. never said these yeah. things. This person wasn't in their life. What do you think about that, Kage? You know, it's interesting because I feel like there's good things about both. When you're doing a time period, a historical movie, uh, The Patriot with Mel Gibson. Oppenheimer. And stuff, Oppenheimer and stuff. Those are easy. You, we, we have the internet. We, we have countless millions and billions of articles and stories telling you about how things were at a certain time. The information is out there, ladies and gentlemen. Directors use it. It is there. Um, that's not to say that they can't muck it up. Mm. Yeah. We've, we've seen movies do that before where they've screwed with history and you piss off some you know, war buffs, you know, or something like that, but they're going to call you out. (laughs) They're going to call you out. Exactly. But like when you're doing a movie based on historical events, I feel like it's easier to get it right. Uh, just because of the research out there. But when it comes to futuristic films, when you got Mm sci-fi, you can kind of do whatever you want. I think to an extent, to an extent. Yeah. Now, if you're doing something based on a book or a video game, Mm -hmm. you're going to want to do, service what, you want to yeah. do close to that but generally if you're do- now if you're doing a sci-fi you're doing a brand new ip that no one knows anything about it's your show do yeah. what you want you can go as off the rails all you know as you want whether it'll be good or not debatable would you say it takes less creativity to do a time period peace film um yeah because you because you have you, you, you have, have the information. The blueprint. You just have to you don't have put everything to, you together. don't have to imagine any anything. Just look at what happened. You can make a story now you can imagine a story in that time period and you can make a story in that. You can do that, but do your research on what's appropriate, what clothing, what how culture was, blah how blah people blah. Speak. How speak people speak, right. how they dress, how buildings look. At versus today, you can look all that up, and you can tell a clear, cohesive story in that. Great, uh, but it's when you start saying, "Well, I'm going to throw a, a 19 or like a 2001 Cadillac in there." It's like mm, that doesn't that doesn't exist now. Now, when you're messing with history, that's when you right. miss the bar clearly. Just not consistent at right, all. Right. Right. Uh, what do you think about that, Buttons? All right. So. So basically, I... like the question is, like we said, you know, just like creativity wise Wise, and creatively do you think it's a lot harder to work on a time period piece or like a modern slash futuristic film yeah so i i will kind of touch a little bit on what kage said about you know when you're talking about where your source material is coming from it's going to make a big difference on how you're going to have the film look so again older period pieces, we have a well-established catalog of information that directors and set designers and actors even can go back and pull on and say, oh yeah, during the 1800s, this is what people would have dressed like. This is what their houses would have looked like. This is, you know, how they would have spoke. Um, And that's great for making something as historically accurate as you can authentic and exactly and uh, accuracy is going to matter to a lot of people especially if you're pulling from a story that is near and dear to them so whether it's you know hey they just really like those period pieces um or hey it's a historical thing that they were you know really interested in like oppenheimer like they they really wanted to know the story behind it um uh, or uh, and going on with like Shakespeare. I mean, the reason why Shakespeare keeps getting made is because there's an audience for it. There's people that are going to keep going and seeing those stories, whether it's a modern version of it or if it's actually set in the period of when, you know, Shakespeare was active. But I do think that with futuristic films that are set in either modern or like a, a futuristic setting, one of the big things that I will say is yes, if it's based off of a book, you want to try and make as close as possible. If it's if it's getting specific into what the technology does or how it looks, then you want to try and make that technology look true to where the source material is, whether it's a comic book or a novel or whatever. Um, 
you want to try and make it match as best you can. I mean, limited technology is going to always be a factor when it comes to how the final finished product ends up looking, depending on how complex it is. I mean, we know like Star uh, Trek, when it first came out, it was like tin foil and Christmas lights and, you know, whatever they had lying around to make these set pieces. Um, and, you know, as it progressed, they were able to put a little bit more money behind it. And then when you get like into next gen um, and, you know, some of the other spinoffs that it, that it developed, you had some real money. special effects. Mm. Yeah, and, and it actually looked like where you're sitting the there board. going, you're like, oh, it's not just a, a <laughs> compact with some stickers in it. You know, it's it's an actual, you know, light up working comm device. Right. You know, it's, it's actually something you can hold and it has a, yeah. a tangibility. Yeah, and it has and it has more of a realistic look to it as far as what futurist, futuristic technology would look like. Um, as far as you know, based off of what we're saying this thing does. Uh, so I will say that when you get into the futuristic stuff, and, and sometimes you can even make the argument that, you know, what do they say, that art imitates life. So when you get into movies like Back to the Future, people were like huge into like, oh yeah, this is supposed to be set in the year uh, 2020. 23. Yeah, was it 2023? I yeah. Thing. Something something like that, right? So they were like making a big deal when we had 2023 come around and they said, oh, you know, this is the date. This is the date that they were supposedly traveling to in the in the future in, in this movie. How many things out of what they said the future would look like are actually, you know, accurate today? So, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, we don't have flying cars, but we do have, you know, the hoverboard. It's not widespread, like it was supposed to be, but we have a functioning hoverboard now. Or they said, hey, here's another way that, you know, it was a prediction in the sense of, you know, the technology that was presented as being available, it was it was only, you know, a mere idea. They were like, wouldn't it be cool if we had this device where you could just talk to it and it had pictures on it and, and you could use it and send, the, you know, and I mean, you're like, oh, well, yeah, we have that now. Like, that is something, it's not exactly what it was, but it's... It, right, it's the either, idea is there. Yeah, the idea mm -hmm. is there. So I think with the futuristic stuff, it's really cool to see directors um, or, you know, these set designers and all these people who do the special effects and stuff come up with something tangible that's useful for the actors and actresses to use in, in trying to say, like, hey, look at how futuristic this is. This is what it's going to be like. We have these food replicators and we have these different things, you know, that are, you know, oh, all you have to do is rehydrate it and it pops up and it's a whole turkey dinner you know like uh even shows like the jetsons and stuff like that where you're sitting there going oh yeah this is what the future is going to be this is you know and and you sit there and you look at what we have nowadays and you're like oh man that stuff looks cheap and fake and you know you go back like i said and you look at it and you're but then you're also like well yeah, but we still don't have flying cars. We don't have robots that do our house cleaning. And then you're like, but we have the Roomba. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right. you know, we've, we've automated what we can. Um, and nowadays, when you look at a film from the 1950s, it's stuff that they would never have imagined that we'd be able to have nowadays. Um, and so it's interesting to see how, you know, with these period films uh, and the futuristic films, how how much has changed generation to generation in terms of what they think the future is going to look like. And then when it comes to the period pieces, you get these new younger um, moviegoers and audiences that are like, man, that's what it was like. They're back exposed then. to something yeah. that is old but new to them. Right, exactly. Mm. Wow, you killed that. Um, as far as, like we said, movies that hold up, I was thinking of some things, and I thought like mm -hmm. Alien and Aliens, mm -hmm. like that still yeah. holds up. Yeah. Was it so much the effects and the, 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 the special effects of that movie, or was it actually how the movie was written? Because I think the writing is what cuts through and makes a movie good enough to stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that movies are so, um, they're, they're, it's almost like a microwave effect, where it's just kind of like, let's just get something out there and let's... 
let's attach ourselves to something that people like and maybe we can exploit that audience and then they'll, we'll make some money off of it and then let's do another remake because you know the first one was good and we can exploit that audience you see what I mean and now you see that implementation of AI coming into writing mm. scripts you see what I mean so they're almost like dumbing down the process of writing movies this is why a lot of movies there's very few movies that we think of now that come out that could hold up 10 20 years mm -hmm. is very few and far between so i'm wondering if it's the writing of the movies from these different eras that makes us really look back and say that's really still good not so much the effects or anything like that because if you look at the, the effects from alien and aliens the effects are decent and they're really good for that time and but now use, the effects are technically things. better but mm -hmm. Those films are better than the new Alien films that we've gotten, whether it have been 15, 20 years ago or things like Prometheus and stuff like Covenant. Those yeah. films are still better than those. So why is it? I think is the writing is weak. Yeah. You know what I mean? What do you think, Kage? Uh, I feel like uh, the genre definitely plays a role. I think uh, sci-fi films uh, can tend to get away with that. Uh, more Disney films get away with it the most again animation they're, they're, yeah animation they're just timeless the good fantasy stories um, I like the comedies like Ace Ventura like I'll still watch that to this day The Mask I'll still watch that to this day <laughs> yeah. with a green a grin on my face uh, those are just a really good time I think um, and yeah it, it just it just depends it just depends on the film you know one it's not I don't want to go too far off topic, but I feel like Dune is a great example. So we got this Dune movie, both the 2021 version and the one coming, part two coming out soon. I feel like 20 or 30 years from now, we're going to be able to have the same conversation that we're having right now about that because it, it's timeless. You, you look at the technology that they use in that film and we look at it today based on technology that was developed in a book written in the 60s and it holds mm, up right, i buy it right okay i'm not digging too deep into it but i accept it and we're moving on we're moving forward and it is still nostalgic it's mm -hmm. gonna have i believe it's gonna have that power and going off of what you said enough about writing 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 is what is is what you are going to remember years from now about that um, and I think that plays a big role in our nostalgic movies mm -hmm. that we're thinking about today, that we're thinking about back in the 90s. Good point. We're thinking about the writing. We're, we remember the stars that were in those movies, and we may remember parts that, you know, right. CG, but at the end of the day, just a rock solid story is right. what and sticks it's, with it's us. Like what you're saying, from a technological standpoint, we have so many much, we have so many more tools to our um, mm -hmm. to our disposal, yet a lot of the movies that you see coming out can't even stand the test of time and they can't even compare to the things that we had 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. or 90s. So that's really like the point. It's yeah. like, that is the weird like um, position that we're in. We have access to more tech and better tech but the product is not getting better. It's getting worse. It yeah. has to be something else. You know, and, and a movie that comes to mind that I still like, mm -hmm. that I think still holds up, mm -hmm. is uh, Starship Troopers. I was just thinking, as you said, before you said that, I was like, he's <laughs> going to say Starship Troopers. Yeah. But then he did uh, say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I read your mind, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Starship Troopers. I watched that again recently. It is still a good time. Practical effects, you got people getting chopped up. I mean, it's definitely not for kids, obviously, right. but you get people stabbed by aliens and they're fighting and they're picked up. And right. I've seen right. behind the scenes stuff where they have animatronic puppetry and people actually being picked up by the bugs. Yeah. And like, it was really cool. And that movie was like really expensive. I saw the box, uh, not the yeah. box, I'm sorry, the budget on that movie. Mm -hmm. And it's like a hundred and like, 60, 180 million yeah. dollars. Like, it's really crazy. But to me, that movie's like a cult classic. Right. You know what I mean? It and is. like we talked about the the difference between like adult humor that's mm. tame and the goofy stuff, right? right? To me, Starship Troopers is a perfect example of adult humor. Yeah. There's things that you're gonna understand as an adult and say, that was that was a funny line right there, but then right. there's serious moments where people die. Like yeah. and yeah. there's no coming back. They, These people no, die. No, no, no. So I, I thought that was cool. What do you got, Kage? Well, I was just gonna say more on Starship Troopers. I mean, think about how many 
people, how many stars they had in it, how many extras that they had in it. They had people, hundreds of people, troopers, running on a planet. They had the practical effects galore. They had the special effects. That, now, granted, granted, it's 2024. I look at the special effects. I'm like, uh, it's dated, but it's yeah. not taken away from the experience, so I'm going to let it go. Yeah, yeah. Um, that begs the question, do I want to see Star Trek Troopers be remade? Does it need to be remade? Because That's the old, the old one, the old one is still a good time. Right. It's still a good time. Because they had sequels after, and I don't think they did that good. We mostly don't, we, because we, of budget. We're not even going to talk about those. <laughs> I haven't even seen them. I have like, no desire to see them. Yeah. They might be funny though, because it is that nostalgic vibe where you know it's not that you know it's not going to yeah, be good. I, but it's just kind of like you know what? I like the story. It's not going to win an Academy Award, but I'm gonna watch it anyway. I was watching like Starship Troopers three on like YouTube, <laughs> but I was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. But, but Rico yeah. still the guy that plays Rico. He's still in it. Yeah, like, yeah, they yeah, keep yeah, him yeah. There, but of course, and, like Denise Richards is gone and, and stuff uh, like that. But it's just like this is ridiculous. But I, it's still like. I'll let it pass. And, <laughs> and you know, I, I will say this, and, you know, I, I've mentioned multiple times that I I like the goofy hu- humor. I, yeah. I just do. That's, yeah, that's a good time wrong for with me. Yeah. I, can, I can turn off my brain, and I can sit down, and I can, I can laugh at the silliness. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think that's another thing that makes something timeless, is if you can sit down, you know, and watch uh, an older movie that was, you know, based off of, you know, characters or themes or whatever from way, way back when, uh, you know, and and you can get a modern uh, day audience to laugh at those jokes. You know, they, they get that, I mean, some sit somebody down in front of the Three Stooges, and if they laugh, then that's timeless. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, if... if, if Regardless, yeah. Yeah, that's a regardless true. That's a of, sign of a true gem, right there. Right. And regardless of what what is going on in it, if you can if you can get your target audience to to laugh at that jokes, then you know it's timeless. Um, I think the biggest thing that dates uh, our content right now would be the technology that's used in it. So I mean, the closer you can get to just actors on a stage. Uh, or a sound set or whatever, just doing their lines and doing their thing, what, regardless of what the topic is or, or what the movie's about. And it can still be given, you know, to a modern audience. And they might say, why is this film in black and white? Oh, maybe they're just doing a, a whole filter thing on it. And, you know, like they've, they've done movies like that on purpose, like like we know the the newest Godzilla movie, they went ahead and they put that in black and white mm-hmm. uh, to make it look more authentic and timeless and like it was made back in the day. So if you can take a movie like that and apply those uh, elements. you know elements to it and it's still enjoyable to the audience, then that is going to make it a timeless piece. Absolutely. For me, I love I love Spaceballs. And yeah, yes. there's a lot of special effects in that that do not hold up. But one of the, you know, one of the jokes in there is simply like, "Oh yeah, let's go look at 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 the radar." And he's like, "Oh okay, why isn't this radar working?" Oh well, that's Mr. Coffee. He, like he, it makes our coffee, and it looks exactly like a, a modern day coffee maker. You know, it's it's completely the same. Like it. You know, you got the little 12 cup, you know, uh, freaking pitcher and, you know, everything else. And it's like, it's, it's a coffee maker. It's, it's a timeless thing. You can go into a diner and see the exact same coffee maker that would have been used back in the forties and fifties being used today. It's the same. I mean, at our place of work, we have those coffee makers that look exactly like probably a coffee maker would have looked Way back it's almost when. like relatable in a mm-hmm. sense. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it doesn't date a project because it's the same. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Yeah. You know? Right. It, it may be it may be weird to think of in the future we're gonna have you know like nowadays we have the Keurig yeah. and we have Nespresso right. and we have all of these things where it's built into the the water drinking fountains now the little K cup right. coffee makers oh yeah so i mean you can buy those things right. now but they still 
make the 12 cup standard coffee right. maker. Like it's still out there. So <laughs> what I think too, and just to piggyback off that, I also think too, based off like, it's like personal, I guess, in a and subjective, like maybe based off your upbringing, what you're exposed to. Definitely. I think sometimes if you look at something that was made in a different time period, you mm -hmm. may have an interest into looking more into it. Mm -hmm. I like the Twilight Zone from like right. the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will say, oh, it's black and white. I don't want but to I like grew up watching Andy Griffith and stuff, mm -hmm. but I'm not like 50. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm like interested in that too. And like Kage had said, you know, as far as the time period stuff, the culture how people talk, uh, how they uh, uh, um, dealt with each other, the clothing, stuff like that. I'm interested in stuff like that. So I'll go back and watch something like Twilight Zone, even though I, I wasn't raised in the 70s or the 60s or anything like that. But I'm just interested out of curiosity, and I like that show. Because, once again, it's keeping me captivated because the writing is good. Oh, and yeah. then you fast forward to where you have Black Mirror, which is almost like the new age version of the Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. You see? So... I and think they that touch was a, on those exactly more modern modern even more futuristic type oh, stuff yeah, that yeah. we're not even towards. Yeah, and Twilight Zone was yeah, doing that exactly. in the '60s. You know what I mean? So and, and that right. was, I was and that was what I was kind of trying to right. say about like Back to the Future. Is you go back and you watch stuff like Twilight Zone, and they made predictions, or they were like, "Oh, hey, yeah, um, wouldn't it be weird if in the future yep. this is what was happening?" Yep. And you're like, you go back and you watch those episodes, and you say. Oh, well, exactly. we, we kind of have, I mean, it's not exactly like that, but it is very similar. Yeah, the right so idea. back in the day, you know, and, and that goes into like art imitating life. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, what we were talking about before, which is simply like, was it nostalgia? Did somebody sit down and be like, I love Twilight Zone. Oh, remember they had that one episode where they were talking about this, this device. I want to see if I can build that device. Mm. So, you know, is it not just... A nostalgia factor but is it also cultivating an interest for future um, generations or the current generation to then try and make those things Correct. like is it is it going to inspire it's them a source to of build? inspiration yeah. exactly i think that's that was that was real good uh i think we're gonna uh end it there buttons you want to take us out on this one uh yeah so uh again you know we're talking about this episode is all about feeling the nostalgia. So, I mean, if there's any um, movies or TV shows or things that you loved about, you know, things that you used to watch when you were a kid or a young adult or whatever, it, it just gives you all the feels and all the vibes okay. of what you remember that you love best, uh, transports you back. Uh, go ahead and, and give us a comment and, uh, of course, always like and subscribe, and we would love to hear, um, you know, anything that you want to hear in future comment uh, or future content for us. So go ahead and, uh, you know, be sure to ring the ring the bell for notifications. And I'm gonna go ahead and say, uh, on behalf of all of us, I'm Buttons and Neff, okay, and have a great night.